Normal graves, normal graves, normal graves, giant monument. Man, that guy must have really hated his family, huh? What, don't believe me? Think that's a pretty wild assumption to make? Well, check out this comment that Bigelow Brook Farms left on my channel a couple weeks ago. Sometime you should look up the giant Bosworth gravestone in Eastford, Connecticut at Westford and Church Road. We had always heard that he hated his family so much that he put all his money into the headstone instead of letting them inherit his money. Always wanted to know if it was true. Well, Bigelow Brook Farms, I would be happy to try and answer that for you. Our first Dime Store Adventures viewer requested story. According to local legend here in Eastford, that rock back there wasn't just born out of run-of-the-mill vanity. That is hatred in stone. That is anger in rock. Animosity, resentment, ill will, rancor, and venom all wrapped up into one big hunk of granite. Does the folklore match the facts? Let's find out. All right, guys, I'm just gonna be upfront with you on this one. The formatting for this video is gonna be very different from what I normally do. See, most of the time I show up at a place and I already have it kind of set in stone what I'm gonna talk about, right? Like I've got a rough outline of what I wanna say and the order I wanna talk about things. And you know, I've got the story pretty much well set in my head, right? But this time when I was coming out here, I really wasn't happy with the information that I had, right? So on the way, I stopped at a whole bunch of local libraries here in Northeastern Connecticut and a bunch of historical societies. And to be honest, my understanding of the Bosworth Stone story kind of got completely flipped on its head. So this video is basically just gonna be me kind of casually ad-libbing and talking you through the information that I found out about the stone and presenting it to you and just kind of letting you decide for yourself what you want to believe. Because I found so many twists and turns in this story today and visited so many interesting places and met so many interesting people that I just want to lay it all out for you, all right? So you're gonna have to forgive me for looking at my phone a bunch here on this one. I'm basically just gonna kind of read off my notes and a bunch of pictures that I took of, of old books and archived things that I found in, uh, in historical societies today. Uh, so let's just get to it, all right? So basically the way that I started out uh, researching this was how I start out everything. Looking at old newspaper sites, you know, Google Books, regular Google, find a grave, all that kind of stuff, you know? Uh, just trying to figure out what this guy's life was about and if there's any initial validity to the story. And I found a few decently helpful things. Like right off the bat, it was easy to find out that the guy's name is Warren Bosworth. He died at the age of 79 in 1903. He ran a general store here in Eastford back in 1877. He voted against abolishing the death penalty in 1845. Oh, and here's his death record, 1903. I'm pretty sure the cause of death entry there says cerebral hemorrhage, but I'm not completely certain. It's like doctor handwriting, I guess. Probably the most useful thing I found though is actually from an old uh, lumber industry magazine. I found an issue from 1906. In there, it kind of had a section on New England England news in the lumber industry and one of the little paragraphs basically says Lauren Bosworth just died we're auctioning off a few hundred acres of his timberland that's pretty useful right it tells us that uh, Bosworth probably made his money for that monument from the lumber industry but then I found something in a treasurer's report from 1908 for the state of Connecticut there was a little section in there on how much the state collected in inheritance tax in 1907 and wouldn't you know it, one of the entries, Lauren Bosworth. $5.71 paid in inheritance tax to the state of Connecticut. So then I was thinking, all right, maybe I can just figure out at least if the basics of this story are true by using numbers, right? If I can <laughs> dig my way into early 20th century Connecticut state tax code, I can kind of reverse the math figure out how much his estate was worth. And once you know it, that treasurer's report actually included how the inheritance tax was calculated at the time. One half of 1%, so one two hundredth of the total value of the estate. And if you don't know, estate in this context basically just means uh, what was the total value of everything that Lauren left behind when he died, right? 
So, all right, we take 200, we multiply it by 571, and we get about 1150 bucks, which you translate that with inflation into 22 or 2022 dollars, and we have about $35,000. That's the value of his estate, right? And then I wanted to try and estimate the value of the monument that he got, right? And I found a similar looking monument over in Salt Lake City that was bought in around the same time that Lauren Bosworth stone would have been built. And I found out that it was built for $1,800. It was the grave marker of Orson Pratt, a very uh, well-known guy in the Mormon church. And 1,800 bucks today would be worth about $58,000. But you know, it's kind of hard to tell just from Google Maps how big that stone is in comparison to the Bosworth stone, right? Luckily for me, I actually had my brother and sister just by pure coincidence visiting Salt Lake City at the time. So I had them jet over there, take a couple of pictures and send them back to me. And wouldn't you know it, the Bosworth stone is way bigger, like way, way, way bigger. So then I'm thinking, all right, the Bosworth stone must have been like minimum 50 grand, right? So if his estate was worth $35,000 and he spent 50 grand on the monument, then probably some veracity to the story, right? There's gotta be at least some kernel of truth in there. Like maybe he bought the stone before he died for 50 grand and then the money he left for his family, only 35 grand. So he spent over half of his money on that giant stone. I mean, why he did that, I would never know just from that mathematical information alone, but it tells you that something is going on here, right? There has to be something in the story just from those numbers alone. And initially I was just gonna leave it at that, right? There we go, boom, there's maybe a kernel of truth to this. I don't know how much from there though, but I wasn't really happy with that, like I said. So on the way over here, I made my way through a whole bunch of libraries and found out a whole bunch of stuff that totally changed everything. All right, so now I'm just gonna thumb through these pictures I took and tell you about the crazy little day I had, all right? So the first place I went was the Killingly Public Library, which is a little ways from Eastford, but I thought it's a big library. They might have some stuff on Wyndham County, which is where we were and I might find some kind of information in there. And boy, did I. Right off the bat, I walk in, I say, hey, you got a local history section? And they say, yeah, right over here. And they show me a whole ton of books. So I get to looking, find some good stuff right away. Like this, the Wyndham County Transcript Death Notices from 1900 to 1909. In there, I found Lauren Bosworth mentioned, which is a good sign. It tells us that, uh, you know, at least the guy uh, might be mentioned in stuff that you can find in this library, right? And then I found this uh, collection of loose leaf paper in a clear plastic binder on historic places, points of interest in Connecticut. And there you go, Lauren Bosworth Monument. The coup de grace that I found in the Killingly Library was this little book, The Colonial Burying Grounds of Eastern Connecticut, which wouldn't you know it, had a section on the Bosworth Monument. But more importantly, it cited another book, a 1976 edition of a very obscure little book on the history of Eastford, Connecticut by Cameron. And when I saw that, I thought, oh my God, please let there be a copy of this online somewhere. This is gonna be exactly what we need uh, because the, the colonial uh, cemetery book that I find found made a point to say that this Eastford book said a whole bunch of stuff about the Bosworth Monument. So I gotta find it, right? So I just kind of sat in the corner of the library for a while on my tiny little phone screen, scrolling, looking through pages, trying to find, and nothing. So I'm thinking, all right, if I can't get my hands on this in person, the information in that book is gonna be lost to me. I'm gonna have an incomplete story here. But I decided to just press on. Maybe I could find it while I'm looking in other libraries. Maybe not. All right, so we got some good stuff from the Killingly Library, right? Now it's time to check out the Putnam Library. So I head a couple miles north up to Putnam. I walk into the library, go up to the library and say, hey, you got a local history section I can check out? And they say, actually, the Putnam Historical Society is open right now and it's in the building right above us and they got all that kind of stuff go talk to him. And I was like, on it. I walk in there, I walk, open up the door, and I gotta tell you, I've been in some like historical society places before. This place, it had an atmosphere, right? I walk in, shelves and shelves of old books. There's one dude, an old guy, standing over a table. He's got big, thick gloves on. He's looking at this gigantic, like three foot long book of old newspapers in Putnam. He's leafing the pages over. There's a woman on a computer a little over there. They're probably working on something. The guy's going, 
I don't see any mention in 1920. Looks like nothing in 1921 either. Oh wait, I got it right here. Look, it was built originally as a fire tower in 1921. And then he sees me and he's like, oh, hey, what can we help you with? So I'm just standing there, right? I'm nervous now. I'm thinking, oh, I'm out of my league. These guys are pros. I'm just a novice. But I suck it up. I say, hey, you got any books on the history of Eastford, Connecticut? Any kind of reference like that up here? The guy goes, eh, I don't think so. It's really mostly Putnam up here. And then the woman at the computer goes, wait, actually, we do have one book on Eastford, Connecticut. And she walks down one of the aisles deep in. I'm watching her hand go up to the aisle. She grabs a book. She pulls it out and it's Cameron's 1976 Eastford history book. The one that I just read about and the one that I was looking for. And I say, hot dog, I grab that, I sit down and I get reading and I find everything. All right, so we got our holy grail, right? Now it's time to look through it, see what we can find from this obscure little 50 year old history book, right? So right off the bat, it tells us that all this information is being pulled out of a letter from 1907. So this is gonna get us basically as close to the truth as we're gonna get. This is a primary source, right? And what does it tell us right off the bat? Lauren Bosworth's monument cost six thousand dollars that is ridiculous that's like 180 grand in today's money remember my initial estimate was going to be like like 50 grand 100 grand no it is way way more than that just an insane amount of money and we we continue to read and we find out why it's because he set aside one sixth of his property in his will to be used on a grave monument. But because he probably didn't actually know how much money he had with all of his assets combined, he had no idea it was gonna be 180 grand total. So in order to fulfill his will, they had to go out of their way to get the most massive, ginormous, huge thing possible, right? Just crazy gigantic so gigantic that as they brought it from hartford to eastford to set up here because it was carved in hartford i guess they had to fortify all the bridges that they were carrying the stone across the thing was so giant so massive so excessive that look at this it says the finest aggregation of teams ever seen in eastford before or since had to be pulled together just to move this giant stone that this guy basically accidentally decreed that he wanted built for him right look at this it took two weeks to get it from hartford all the way over here and they went at the speed of one mile every three hours just crazy but here's probably the most important part and the part that's most pertinent to our story right because remember the original story was that lauren did this because he hated his family right this, and remember, this is from a guy who knew Lauren, lived in Eastford with Lauren. Some townspeople are disgusted that a man who is disliked by quite a few should have such a fine monument. So people hated this guy, and now they're being forced to spend two weeks of their time dragging a several ton hunk of granite across Connecticut so that it can be the biggest, most gigantic behemoth in the middle of their little town cemetery for the rest of their lives. Hey guys, it's me. Just wanted to throw in some quick voice over here. I'm back at my house editing, but I was just thinking you might be wondering why the original estimation I came up with for the value of Lauren Bosworth's estate was so low. And it's because the treasury report that I was pulling the tax code from actually Actually was incomplete. Uh, once I got back to my house, I looked into it and I found this handy little book from 1908, which just kind of goes over general inheritance tax, both federally and across all the states. And as you can see right here, it's not just one half of 1%. It's one half of 1% of every dollar beyond $10,000. So the first $10,000, there is zero inheritance tax. So that's why I had such a low guess. Hey, so I think it's about time we wrap this up, right? What did we come out here originally to answer? Did Lauren Bosworth really spend all his money on that giant monument so that his family couldn't have any? I think we've probably figured out today that that can't exactly be true, right? I mean, remember in the Cameron book, we saw that Lauren stipulated that one sixth of the total value of his estate be spent on the monument. We don't know what happened to the other five sixths. Maybe he went to his family, maybe not. But if he built that monument explicitly and only so that his family wouldn't have any access to his money, would have spent a lot more than one sixth on it, right? Which would have been an insane amount, but still. But 
I think personally at least the story that we did uncover is actually a little more interesting than the legend. I mean, think about it. We saw that the people of Eastford, Connecticut hated Lauren Bosworth. Can you imagine being some guy that lived here in 1903? You hate Lauren Bosworth gu Bosworth's guts. You find out that he finally died. You're so excited. Oh my God, he's finally gone. I hated that guy. We all hated that guy. And then you find out that he misunderstood how much money he had and accidentally ordered himself a several ton pound hunk of granite worth 180 grand that now you and a bunch of other people from Eastford have got to lug across the state of Connecticut. You got to reinforce all the bridges around town. You got to drag this big rock down the dirt roads, horse teams behind you. You're so tired, your back hurts, but every time you look behind you, you see his name up on that monument. Bosworth, Bosworth, Bosworth. Finally, you get here, you plunk it down in the middle of the cemetery. You look around, you see all your family members here in Eastford, your ancestors. Now they're in the shadow of this giant excessive monument of a man that you hated. And you know that if you're ever buried in the cemetery, you're gonna be stuck underneath his umbrella too. I don't know, that's a pretty good story to me, I think. But I'll see you guys next time. Hey, what's up everybody? Check out this humongous monument behind me here. Over 30 feet tall and cut from solid marble. This thing absolutely towers over the rest of this tiny cemetery here in Ashford, Connecticut. It's even got this cool like ornamental wall surrounding it, complete with a set of 600 pound stone urns just for that extra flourish, right? And hey, you know what? Gravestones of this size and opulence tend to be real magnets for folklore and legend, and this one is no different. So let me tell you a story real quick. Far and away, the most common legend that's passed around about this stone. If you read like basically anything written in the last 40 years or so about this monument, this is the story that will be presented to you as fact. Ready? Here we go. Back in the 1800s, a man named Lucas Douglas lived on the edge of homelessness here in Ashford, Connecticut. With no friends and family to speak of, old Lucas used to float his way through a sad, lonely life until an ice cold December night back in 1895 upon which Lucas Douglas's body was discovered on the street, frozen in a snowbank. Now, at the time of his death, Douglas was thought of as just a pauper, right? Like, essentially penniless. But all that changed once the town started looking into Douglas's will and estate. To the absolute shock of the town of Ashford, it was discovered that Lucas Douglas had thousands of dollars secretly saved up. And what's more, he had stipulated that every single cent of his small fortune would be spent on a massive, extravagant grave monument. And that is how we ended up with the stone that we see here today. Pretty cool, right? Only one problem. I'm not exactly sure that that story is true, or at least it's partially untrue, or at the very least, that version of the story leaves out a whole bunch of details that I think are pretty interesting, right? You see, after I started getting into the nitty gritty a little more on this story, you know, like really digging into the hundred plus year old newspaper articles and history books written about this monument, I started to uncover another story, a completely different story that, that, <laughs> that might sound very, very, very familiar to longtime subscribers to this channel. All right, so let's start at the beginning here. A few months ago, I made a video called A Monument to Loathing, which is still the most viewed video on my channel to this day. And if you haven't seen that video, I super duper recommend you pause this one and go watch the original right now. I'll put a link to, at the top of the description in this video so you can find it easily. If you haven't seen that first one, then this video, there's gonna be parts of it that don't make a lot of sense, right? But if you watched that video when it first came out in March and you need a quick refresher, let me give you a super brief summary. So basically one of my viewers sent me a message and was like, hey, there's this super giant monument headstone thing in a cemetery in my hometown of Eastford, Connecticut. 
And there's this local legend that I always heard growing up about it, about how the guy who the monument is for was super rich and instead of, uh, you know, letting his family inherit all his money, he put into his will that he wanted every single cent of his estate to be spent on a gigantic monument so that nobody in his family could get any money, right? Like the dude hated his family so much, he'd rather put all his money into a monument rather than let his family have it. And I was like, heck yeah, I'll totally check that out. So I ended up driving all over Northeastern Connecticut to like a bajillion different like libraries and cemeteries, historical societies, stuff like that, right? And through a series of convoluted events and some pretty miraculous luck, I ended up uncovering the real story in this super rare random old book that I just totally stumbled upon, right? And that real story ended up being that the man behind the monument, Lauren Bosworth, actually only put in his will that he wanted one sixth of his estate spent on the gravestone. But he really didn't have that good of a grasp on exactly how much money he had. So one sixth of his total estate ended up being a humongous amount of money. And long story short, the town of Eastford got wrapped up into this like weeks long process of dragging this excessively huge gravestone for miles across Connecticut in a process that involved like reinforcing bridges and roads and hours and hours of grueling manual labor. Oh and, oh, and by the way, I should probably mention that most people in Eastford did not like Warren Bosworth that much, but because he accidentally ordered himself a gigantic monument, tough luck. Now you're responsible for breaking your back, lugging this thing through the countryside, right? And I thought that was it, right? Like just when I thought that I had bested the Lauren Bosworth monument, just when I thought that I had figured out every one of its secrets, just when I thought that I could close the book on its case, a whole bunch of new information reached out and grabbed me by the throat. So hold on tight, because we got a whole new story to tell. Good to see you, old friend. All right, so now we're back at the Lucas Douglas Monument, and before we get too deep into this, let me just clearly define these two monuments for you, because we're going to be jumping back and forth a bunch, and I don't want you to get too confused. So, this tall one in Ashford, Connecticut, is the Lucas Douglas Monument, and the short squat one is the Lauren Bosworth Monument over in Eastford, Connecticut. And please also note that these two monuments are well under 10 miles from each other. Like Eastford and Ashford are basically neighboring towns. And also Lauren Bosworth and Lucas Douglas, they both died like less than 10 years apart from each other too. So it is totally possible that people who lived in this area back in the day knew both of these guys, or at the very least knew about both of these giant towering stones, right? But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. so. Just keep all that in mind for me. So anyway, the whole reason that I'm making this video is because I wanted to investigate that homeless guy with a secret stash story that's told about the Douglas Monument, right? So I started digging around in old books and newspapers that were written back around the same time that Douglas died. And right away, it seemed like at least the skeleton of the modern story was accurate. Like, you know, this loner named Lucas Douglas lived in Ashford, he died, and then it was discovered that his will demanded that all his money be put in this giant monument. But there's also plenty of stuff out there to find beyond just that basic narrative, right? Like even a little about Lucas Douglas's life before he died. Like for example, here's a couple things. I was able to uncover that Lucas Douglas was a shoemaker and he never got married, and he was considered eccentric by his community. And, oh, and once apparently he walked to Canada, although literally no source I ever found bothered to explain why he did that. Like that little anecdote is always just completely randomly inserted into the article with zero context or ex explanation. Oh yeah, old Douglas. Yeah, he was a shoemaker. He lived in Ashford. He used to, you know, go over to Staffordsville for groceries. He walked to Canada. Oh, and also he never got married. But anyway, as I was going through all these details about Douglas's life, uh, it really didn't take long for me to start noticing some tension between the modern story and the information that I was digging up, right? Like, for example, remember one of the most central features in that modern story was that Douglas was basically like completely destitute before he died, right? Like it was supposed to be this total shock that he had all this money saved up because everybody who knew him thought he was basically completely bankrupt, right? But honestly, I found 
pretty much nothing to really substantiate that claim. Like even just to start, Douglas was a shoemaker, right? Like he definitely had a job and he was definitely capable of making money. That's something that pretty much none of the modern accounts ever mention. But even beyond that, like just the language that the journalists from back in the 1890s used, like, I don't know, it just really doesn't make sense for how you would write about a homeless person. Like they always introduce Douglas as like, wealthy farmer or having a small fortune or they just literally like straight up say that he had a bunch of physical property like it's never ever ever mentioned that this money was a secret or that nobody knew about it or that it was some surprise that he had a pile of cash right i mean so that language to me at least just doesn't really mesh well with the modern story i mean if you were like a journalist in a small town and it was discovered that a homeless guy who just died secretly had like two hundred thousand dollars in this hidden bank account would you just like introduce the guy in your article by calling him local wealthy resident like no the the headline of the story would be that he secretly had all this money but i never saw anything like that mentioned at all in the articles that were written right after douglas died oh and by the way in case you're wondering about how i originally found out about this story and why i'm making this video like months after the original Monument to Loathing, it's because I first heard about this monument through that secret money version of the story. So I had no idea that there was any kind of connection between these two monuments. And just recently I finally decided, okay, I better poke around into this story, see if there's potential for a video there. And pretty quick I realized <laughs> there is a lot of potential for a video here. Anyway though, let's keep it moving with the Douglas Monument. So we got it established that there's a pretty good chance that Lucas Douglas's wealth wasn't some kind of like surprise, right? So let's move on to another topic, his death. So basically every single modern version of the story says specifically that Lucas Douglas died on the streets of Ashford, right? Like that specific phrase is everywhere. There was always the implication that he just like keeled over on the side of the road somewhere because he was this vagabond with nowhere to sleep, right? But not only did I find absolutely nothing to support that idea, I actually found evidence to the contrary. Like, look at this newspaper article I found from 1906. It says that Douglas was actually found dead in a snowbank between his house and his barn. So not only is he not dying poor and starving on the street, he's dying on his own property at his own house, which by the way is just another reason that the story about him being totally penniless might be a little exaggerated, right? But anyway though, if you ask me, I think there is a very good chance that somebody read this little inscription on the side of the monument that talks about how Douglas died. Like one of the lines talking about his death says that he died on a pillow of snow in a roofless street. So I'm thinking somebody kind of took that street part literally instead of as some kind of metaphor and I don't know, maybe it was meant to be literal, but bottom line, we've got some pretty, you know, hard, clear claims here from a source that was written pretty close to after Douglas died, saying that he definitely didn't die in the street. But I don't know, it's tough to be certain on this kind of stuff, right? Oh, and by the way, you might've noticed that that newspaper article we were just talking about is from Hartford, Kentucky which is a pretty far cry from Connecticut, right? Like, why is somebody in Kentucky writing about something so far away? Well, this little Kentucky newspaper was far from the only non-New England publication to pick up the story. This whole Lucas Douglas event was kind of like halfway national news when it first happened. I mean, it definitely wasn't some like giant front page story running in every newspaper in the country or anything like that, but it got around for sure. Like I found columns for this story in, in, uh, in Illinois, Pennsylvania, Kansas, Alabama, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, and like even plenty more beyond that. Like people were into this story. It was really getting people's attention for a while there. But all right, now it's time that we get into the monument itself, right? Like what? specifically did it say in Douglas's will? Well, the first thing to talk about is the cost. Like how much did it, how much did it take to build this thing, right? Well, the numbers are like eh, a little bit fuzzy, but we can be pretty sure that it's right around somewhere between 10 and $14,000, which in, in 2022 money would be like 
400 grand. So this thing was real expensive, right? And that huge price tag, it wasn't just from its size either. Like Douglas had some pretty specific directions in his will. Like for example, the wall and urn surrounding the grave that we already talked about, that is some intricate stuff and it does not come cheap. But even more importantly than that is the fact that Douglas wanted almost the entire thing carved specifically from Italian marble, meaning that tons and tons of this stuff had to be boated all the way across the Atlantic just for this headstone, right? Oh, and hey, uh, genuine Italian marble isn't exactly something that you see every day, right? Even more so back in the 19th century. So this stone was some seriously rare stuff in these parts back in the day. Like so much so that this is pretty cool. From what I've read, it used to be very common for relic hunters to sneak up on this thing in the middle of the night so they could chip off a chunk under the cover of darkness and then make off back into the black with a piece of rare stone, right? Looking at the actual stone in person, I'm not sure where these chips from the relic hunters are supposed to be. I mean, there's a bunch of like marks on the sides of it here and here, stuff like that, like all around it, but I don't know if that's just natural wear and tear, or if somebody really did come over here with a chisel and knock a little bit off, who knows? Oh, and while we're on the topic of uh, physical features of the monument, like here's another funny little detail. You see that base carved into the stone up there? You would probably think that that's Lucas Douglas himself, right? But you would be wrong or kind of wrong. I mean, that is supposed to represent Lucas Douglas, but it's, not him, but <laughs> just let me explain. So apparently Lucas Douglas, for whatever reason, just refused to let anybody take his picture. So when it came time for the stone carvers to add the portrait to that thing, they were just like, well, we don't really have any pictures that we can use. So I guess for a reference, uh, how about Lucas Douglas's nephew? Yeah, get over here, son. Come on, come stand in front of this thing so the carvers can get to work. So yeah, that's not Lucas Douglas's face. That's Lucas Douglas's nephew pretending to be Lucas Douglas. All right, so it's almost time for the big reveal now, right? But before we get there, I wanna wrap up the whole thing about the modern story versus the stuff that I found, right? Like, like even though I've been kind of halfway poking holes in the modern accounts of this story, it is technically possible that it's mostly true, right? Like maybe Douglas was a pauper and it was some shock that he had all this money and just none of the newspapers mentioned that or maybe they didn't know about it, I don't know. And maybe he did actually die in the street. I mean, that one newspaper article I found was written a, at least a couple of years after Douglas died. And it also was written in Kentucky, like a lot of miles away from Connecticut. So I don't know, I mean, it's totally possible that those modern accounts are right and I'm wrong. Like, I don't wanna make it sound like I'm some kind of like superhero researcher guy who knows everything and is always right. Like I could totally be wrong here too. But the one thing that I'm certain about is that all those modern accounts of the story left out what I think is the most interesting part of the narrative of the Lucas Douglas monument. So like we've covered, Douglas set aside a bunch of money, right? In the realm of 10 or 11 grand for his huge monument and its maintenance. But he also set aside a little money for his family too. His two sisters both got a little payday. And they were the only other people in his family that any money went to, right? The only other thing at all that any of Douglas's money went to. So here's the final breakdown, you ready? 11 grand or whatever for this huge gravestone 50 bucks for one sister and one dollar for the other sister. So that's 51 bucks for his family and $12,000 for his grave monument. Is this story starting to sound a little familiar now? I mean, remember the original piece of folklore surrounding that Bosworth or the Bosworth monument? It was that Lauren Bosworth hated his family so much that he put all his money into a gravestone instead of giving it to them. Well, isn't that just exactly what Lucas Douglas is doing over here? I mean, we don't have any evidence for sure that he hated his sisters, right? But like, Come on, like, 
What what other reason could you possibly have for giving one of your sisters one dollar when you have thirteen thousand dollars? I mean, he's obviously sending some kind of message there, right? Oh, and and here's another little tidbit for you too. Apparently, after Douglas's will was read, his sisters started freaking out about it, like trying to challenge it on legal grounds, saying that nobody but an insane man would ever want twelve thousand dollars to go to a humongous gravestone right so i mean this just adds like a whole new dimension to our original story right i mean last time we answered the question of is this story true but now we can confidently say or at least semi-confidently say where did this story come from and the answer is right here i mean obviously we can't be sure but it seems pretty likely to me that this is just a case of folklore migration right i mean we have two excessively gigantic gravestones that were built within 10 years of each other and stand less than 10 miles away from each other and so to me it seems like as time passed and the tale was told from generation to generation the story about hating your family just moved a little a couple miles down the road and the legend about hating your family so much that you built a huge gravestone just swapped from Lucas Douglas to Lauren Bosworth. And Lucas Douglas got a new story attributed to him instead, one about being a homeless guy who secretly had a bunch of money. But we're not even done. It gets even better. Remember how I made a huge deal in that first video about how hard it was to actually facilitate the terms of Bosworth's will? Like how tough it was to get that thing set up in the cemetery? You know, this weeks long, super physically demanding job where they had to use like a huge amount of horses and manpower, reinforce the bridges, drag this thing across the countryside? Well, get ready for this. They had to do the exact same thing for the Lucas Douglas monument back here. But somehow it was even more of an ordeal. Not only did they have to reinforce the bridges and roads again, not only did they, did they have to recruit massive teams of horses and oxen and men again, this time, because the thing was so long, every time they reached like a corner in a road or a bend, they had to swing it wide into the fields of the neighboring farmers. So like imagine you're some farmer who only ever knew Lucas Douglas as that weird loner shoemaker guy and now you've got to deal with his 16 ton gravestone just crushing the life out of all your crops right and that's just the beginning like get a load of this apparently they also had to literally knock the wall out of this cemetery here just to get the monument in oh and here's another cool thing remember how they had to bring the marble across the Atlantic Ocean well the first time they tried to do that the ship sank in a storm. So somewhere out there in the middle of the Atlantic is Lucas Douglas's original block of marble sitting at the bottom of the ocean with crabs crawling all over it. Oh, and how about this one? Here's the real cherry on top. Trying to get this thing set up was such an ordeal that the literal state government had to get involved. Like it was too small for the first cemetery they were gonna put it in. So they literally had to bring a bill to the state legislature to argue over whether they should move it into a bigger cemetery or not. Apparently the argument over the whole thing got so heated that the literal governor had to step in and authorize moving the stone. Like, isn't that just completely insane? This one dude ordered himself such a huge headache for his community that the governor had to get involved. And hey, don't forget, the Bosworth Monument and the Douglas Monument were put up in the same part of the state less than 10 years from each other. Those poor people had to go through that whole ordeal twice. Twice they had to figure out how to drag a 20 ton block down the road. Like, isn't it just so easy to imagine two guys in a bar, a young guy and an old guy, and they're having a conversation. The old guy is saying, man, you're lucky you were just a kid when old Lucas Douglas keeled over. We had to reinforce all the bridges. We had to crush old farmer Ben's crops. We had 30 oxen out there dragging that thing down the road. I still feel a pain in my lower back from just how tough it was to do that. You're just lucky you're never gonna have to deal with that again. And I'm lucky that I'm not gonna have to go through that either. And then the door of the bar opens up. Another guy walks in and says, hey, you guys know old uh, Lauren Bosworth? And everybody goes, yeah, I always hated that guy. 
And the dude at the door says, well, you're not gonna believe this, but we better go reinforce the bridges again. <laughs> oh, thanks for watching, guys. A picture of the Lauren Bosworth Monument being transported across Connecticut. And this is, a, this is actually more than just a picture because what this is, is a 100 plus year old postcard depicting the long perilous journey of the Lauren Bosworth Monument across Northeastern Connecticut. It is so cool to actually hold this in my hands. You know, I've been thinking and talking about this exact journey for close to half a year now. And it's just so insane to actually see the horses and the people and the carts that were involved in transporting this thing across all these old dirt roads. This is so cool to see too, because it just like really confirms a lot of the findings that we uncovered in those first two videos, right? Because if you look at this, it is just the base of the Bosworth Monument. So not even the entire thing. And the base alone already requires like, <laughs> what is this, like 16 horses here pulling this thing and probably like, 10 or 12 men standing around it who are a part of the caravan. Man, it is just, it is crazy to look at this. <laughs> this postcard was actually sent too through the mail, which makes it even cooler. You know, it's postmarked as January 14th, 1908. Even got the old vintage one cent stamp on it too. <laughs> it's funny to look at this too, because uh, if you remember from the first Lauren Bosworth monument video, I made like a really big deal about how a lot of people in Eastford really didn't like Lauren Bosworth that much. <laughs> so it's just like so easy to look at this picture and look at all those guys like sitting on the cart and just imagine how much <laughs> they're hating that they've got to drag this humongous thing across Connecticut <laughs> in the memory of this dude that they didn't even like. <laughs> also, uh, doesn't the fact that this thing exists at all really drive home the point about how much of an event the Lauren Bosworth Monument traversal must have been back in the day. I mean, they literally made a postcard about it, so it must have been a big deal, right? <laughs> but anyway, I hope uh, seeing that was as cool for you guys as it was for me.